Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to Frequently Asked Questions for beekeeping number 12. This is episode 12. I can't believe we've done so many so far. If you've seen the others, thank you for coming back. That's a good uh, vote of confidence there. And for those who are frequently posting questions down in the uh, comment section, thank you for those too because that's why I'm here to answer your questions. This series is geared towards beginning beekeepers and those uh, who don't have bees yet, but maybe they're thinking about it. We are adding a lot of content. So uh, if you have questions yourself, the way we do it is you write your questions down in the comment section below the video. And uh, if it seems to have a broad appeal to several people that are watching these videos, then uh, I'll answer these the following week. So generally we put these out on Friday or Saturday. Today is Friday, April 12th, and uh, things have really really made a turn for the better here even though it's super windy if you've been watching the sequence at the very beginning of this video the wind has picked up a lot 20 mile an hour wind gusts but the uh, thermometer just turned over 70 degrees out there the bees are flying they're bringing in their pollen and uh, we have swarm traps out if you have not put out swarm traps yet and if you have swarm traps look at the video that i just put out uh, yesterday or the day before which is uh, on the swarm trooper which is a, a special pack that's designed to strap into trees and it's uh, dimensionally uh, laid out so that it'll be a very attractive to those scouting bees that are trying to find a home. A lot of people that have bees now, and if the numbers are strong coming into spring, they're gonna swarm. So let's get right into this. Uh, the very first question is from China Floyd and I combined it with uh, St. Germain's question. China Floyd asks what my favorite thing to do is, and I'm assuming that's with chickens or bees. And uh, also St. Germain put in there what's more interesting, chickens or bees. So if you don't know, uh, I've been doing poultry for a long time, I'm a licensed poultry technician with the Department of Agriculture in the state of Pennsylvania, and we are in the United States in the Northeast. So I've been involved with poultry for many, many years, and uh, chickens and bees really don't compare to one another as far as responsibility, commitment, things like that. I have uh, three chicken coops out there. We have uh, a broad range of chickens with a broad range of breeds. If you're interested in knowing more about my chickens, uh, I published a video back in 2006 titled Regarding Chickens. It's for sale on Amazon. It's only $8 including shipping, so I have to plug myself there. Uh, honeybees are for a completely different reason. Uh, when it comes to getting into honeybees, remember, I've only been raising honeybees myself for 12 years. But I've been studying honeybees long before that and I photographed honeybees and made videos that were used by researchers years prior to that. So my experience with honeybees is uh, kind of technical in the beginning. So uh, with the chickens, it's just that you want to keep chickens. Chickens are fun, they're easy. You know, I can explain in a single video, in a single episode, how to raise chickens from incubation all the way up through ranging them, and mine are free-range chickens. So they go out and do their own thing all day long. Uh, when it gets really cold outside, they're sheltered. Now there are similarities to chickens and bees when it comes to winter care, for example. We just make sure that they have food and water and uh, that they are sheltered from the wind. Chickens, uh, just like bees, if you can just keep them out of the wind, they will cluster up, chickens will fluff their feathers, and they will stay warm, and they'll get through. Uh, chickens don't leave you as puzzled as honeybees do. So in a lot of regards, chickens are just a stress reliever, where even though you get pleasure from watching honeybees, and my favorite thing to do to answer that first question by China Floyd there is a uh, you know, when the wind dies down and it's late in the afternoon and all the hives are active and the bees are coming and going and doing their thing, my favorite thing to do is to sit out there in a chair right next to the hive, as close as I am to this camera, and I just like to watch the bees come and go. So see what they're doing, see their behavior on the landing board, watch the uh, guard bees intercept and inspect. Uh, the other thing is an observation beehive. When you have an observation beehive, it's like, you know, we're gonna get into that on one of these questions here. By the way, if you wanna know what questions we're gonna discuss in this video, they are in the video description. So you can tell early if we're gonna to touch on something you're interested in or not. I don't want you wasting your time here. So, um, but when it comes to observation hives, the ability to look inside a beehive, 
without disrupting the bees and see the activities in there and the intricate behaviors that go on, uh, it's a time trap. You go out there for 15 minutes to check up on something and next thing you know, it's been three hours. I also like to sit in my bee building and uh, just listen to the bees. I think that people that keep chickens and bees, uh, if they're really doing it right, will find that it's a great stress reliever. And they'll find that that distraction, getting away from YouTube, although stay on YouTube till this is over with, but as soon as this video is over and you've clicked your like and you subscribe to my channel, run outside and stare at things because that's the nature fix. Uh, chickens are gonna roam around your yard and they're gonna debug. You know, chickens from the time they come out of a chicken coop, they range around your property and uh, they eat bugs all day long and they snip blades of grass and they know what to eat and what not to eat and they look out for each other and they're social and they interact and you can pick one up and hold a chicken if you want to, if that makes you happy. If you want to expand your chicken flock, you uh, let them have fertile eggs and you put that in the incubator or you might have a broody hen that'll hatch the chicks on their own. So chickens are straightforward, totally predictable. It's very rare that I'm surprised by a chicken. And the flip side of that is it's very rare that I'm not surprised by honeybees. Honeybees, the very second I think I've figured something out that I've decoded those honeybees and I know what they're gonna do, they do something new, they do something different. And uh, often they, they point out our own uh, ignorance. We just don't anticipate well sometimes what a honeybee is going to do and for that reason, Honeybees are the infinite challenge and they are a source of endless learning. So chickens and bees, chickens are simple, bees are complex. They both uh, can make us healthier just by interacting with them. When you have bees that succeed, there's no greater feeling than that. Coming out of winter and seeing that your bees are alive uh, is, uh, is very exciting. So they're, they're very different things, but I do want to say that Chickens and bees are great companion animals. My uh, apiary is not fenced other than an electric fence and I only put that up seasonally when we have bears around. Uh, the chickens roam freely through the bee yard. They don't eat the bees, they don't care about the bees. What they do is they, they pick up bugs and stuff around the beehives. They roam right up next to the beehives. The, the bees don't even seem to care about them. And uh, so they're, they're pest control. If you see little moths and things trying to fly across a yard in the middle of the day, a chicken will run 60, 70 feet to snap up a little moth. So from 14 inches down, insect survival rates on my property are very low. If you don't like spiders, you're not gonna have any around your foundations or under your beehives, for example, if you've got chickens roaming around because they're just gonna eat them. So as far as uh, small hive beetle larvae and things like that, when they make that uh, transition from the beehives down into the ground where they have to pupate and then they're gonna come back out as uh, adult beetles that can fly. Some people say that the chickens keep those completely under control. I don't know if they do. I haven't seen you know chickens digging out beetle larvae, but it's possible. So, um, but you know, chickens, bees, they get along great. If you want to keep both, I really don't have a favorite because they serve two primarily different purposes for me. The, the bees are a source of study and frustration and they cause me to worry about the weather. And so uh, bees will stress you out uh, just because you're constantly having to plan and uh, hopefully get ahead of what they might do. Chickens just do what chickens do. They're so easy going. They take care of themselves. If you've got the right breed of chicken, You've, uh, you've got a hands-off bird if you don't want to. And if you want it to be a pet, then uh, you can raise chicks and uh, they can be your friends. But I don't recommend that because they would follow you around everywhere and you'll never get a moment's peace because the minute you're outside, they run up to you and they jump on your shoulders and everything as my children have learned. So I don't have a favorite. My favorite pastime though, thing to do is just to watch uh, watch bees come and go. I also like to go out and see what plants they're on and observe them closely. And it's no secret that I like to video and photograph bees. Uh, the cinematography that I do gets used widely and uh, I'm always looking for a better lens, better equipment and uh, some audio gear to get even closer. There were some uh, master's degree program people at uh, Cornell Department of Entomology that wanted some of my audio recordings of the bees interaction and how they communicate beeping and piping and things like that. So for me, it's, it's part of my job. 
So collecting information and data from the bees is endless. So for that, it's very appealing in that way. There's always something new. But I don't have a single favorite thing that I can narrow it down to. But if you're keeping bees and you're living in the country and you're looking for a companion animal, chickens are great. I highly recommend them. Okay, so the next thing was from James Knoll. Best kind of sugar to feed. This comes out a lot in the fall and in the spring. Why? Because that's when we're feeding them. If the uh, resources aren't being provided, we're not in a nectar flow here yet. Uh, where I live, we have plenty of pollen coming in. If they're bringing in nectar, it's, it's minimal. So this is a time of year where a lot of people are trying to get a, a jump on honeybee production, and then wanna be sure they have the resources they need. So the pollen is gonna provide what we call bee bread. That's the protein source, the plant protein that is going to be used to feed the brood, and they're going to rear the brood. We want them to have all that they need because we want really strong, super fat bees coming out so that they can forage far and they can, of course, maintain warmth on the brood frames. And that's where they're going to consume energy. And where does the energy come from? Sucrose. It comes from sugar. So I have bags of sugar conspicuously placed here on my table. A lot of people have opinions about exactly what kind of sugar you need to use. This is just Giant Eagle Pure Cane Sugar. Some people will get way down the rabbit hole on exactly what kind of sugar to put in. Uh, there are two sources. Maybe you never really paid attention to white processed sugar that we see on our dinner tables and people put in their coffee and so on. Granulated sugar comes from two primary sources. There is cane sugar. And that is the across the board favorite by everyone who feeds bees. There's also beet sugar. So some of the sugar that you're getting is not 100% pure cane sugar. It may come from sugar beets. And then there are people that are concerned that the sugar beet sugar is not as good for your bees as the pure cane sugar is. So if you're gonna split hairs on that and you have the choice, cane sugar, beet sugar, go with the pure cane sugar. It's gonna provide the sugar energy that they want you're going to mix it with water and you're going to hear terms like uh, make syrup for your bees and they'll say do a one to one or a two to one. Two to one is generally late in the fall when it's still warm enough that the bees are flying, but they also aren't going to be able to dehydrate a lot of water out of it. So that's two to one ratio sugar to water and one to one this time of year is what you're going to want to put out there in your rapid round feeder, your hive top feeder, whatever you have out there if you're going to provide syrup for the bees because like I said, today it's going to be 70 degrees outside. Guess what else is coming? Rain. So the bees aren't going to be able to go out and get pollen and nectar in the rain, and we want to keep them strong because what will happen is if they can't keep the brood warm and they don't have enough humidity in the hive at this time of year, they're going to uh, produce less brood, and some of it may even die out if we get these really cold nights, which we still do. So it's going to drop into the mid-30s again. And uh, if they don't have sugar, the carbohydrates uh, to fuel their muscles so that they can vibrate, generate heat, and keep the brood warm, then they again are stressed. And at the very least, they're going to consume resources they've already stored because my bees are storing nectar. I don't know where they're getting it. Maybe somebody else a couple miles away is already open feeding somewhere and my bees are getting nectar from that. The other thing is they might be robbing out dieouts. Uh, from the winter. So if there are beehives that are empty, that the bees have died inside and there's still resources in there, honey, then uh, you want to close those up and start pulling those apart because bees will start robbing them out. So, but my favorite sugar, pure cane processed sugar. Some people will say, uh, remember, every beekeeper has an opinion. Some are more science-based than others. Some are anecdotal where they just say, oh yeah, well that works. I know it does because uh, that's what my friend said. Uh, if you're using raw sugar, unprocessed sugar, there are other trace elements in that uh, that may not be super beneficial to your bees. So uh, you can't go wrong if you fall back to specifically 100% cane sugar. And when you're mixing it one-to-one, -one, that's by weight. So if you have an eight-pound jug of water, which is what a gallon of water weighs, then you'll have eight pounds of sugar. So this is only a five-pound bag. So that's not even a gallon. So what you'll do then is, pound for pound, you'll mix that together and you won't superheat it either. Tap water, 
hot tap water and mix that with uh, your sugar and then uh, you've got the syrup that they'll use. And again, this isn't being fed to baby bees, for example. It's not as critical as the protein that they're getting from the plants. So um, sugar is energy. That's all it is. Now, some people will talk about, and I have a bunch of it staged right here. This is Brood Booster. We have uh, Pro Health. We have uh, Honey Bee Healthy. So there are all these feed supplements that are designed. These are essential oil mixes that are designed to go into your sugar syrup so when you're feeding sugars to your bees, it's supposed to improve their health and stimulate their appetites and get smaller colonies to become bigger colonies and things like that. Uh, I will say for sure what the essential oils will do is make your sugar syrup smell good uh, when it goes into the plastic containers if you're using rapid round and things like that uh, for your feeders and you use essential oils, that plastic is gonna smell like essential oil for a long time and embeds itself. Is there a health benefit? I don't know. But I know that if you offer straight sugar syrup without any of the essential oils, the bees will go for that first. And uh, then someone will say, well, that, yeah, that's just like putting cupcakes out for you know children. They're gonna eat the cupcakes before they eat the broccoli and the asparagus. So. Uh, I disagree with that because bees, uh, when they don't have resources in the environment, will take the sugar syrup, but the minute that uh, there are nectar producing plants out there, they're going to start to back off on the syrup and they're going to use the plant exclusively. So bees definitely know what they need and they are definitely attracted to uh, the resources that are the healthiest for them while they're available. So if the only thing you offer is sugar syrup, with one of the essential oil mixes, then that's what they're gonna take. But if you give them choices, you're gonna learn quickly what the bees actually are letting you know that they need. So what's the benefit of essential oils in your sugar syrup when you're using your pure cane sugar? Uh, it's gonna preserve the sugar so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't break down and you won't get bacteria in it as quickly. Because you know sugar will generate yeast and everything else. So you want to use just the amount, hopefully, that your bees are going to use you can extend the life of your sugar syrup by adding essential oils, uh, any number of these. Although last year we did uh, do essential oil testing and I think of the essential oils, Honey Bee Healthy was pretty much the, the most popular choice. Pro Health I think came in second and this spring we're going to of course continue those and we're gonna put the mixes out and we're gonna see uh, with these four samples here what the bees are gonna prefer. So again, this is to kick everything off. Do you want to be feeding sugar syrup and uh, you know essential oils and things after the nectar flow begins and you're going to be drawing off potentially some of that honey for your own resources and harvesting? Uh, once you're in a nectar flow and once you've decided that this is where you're going to let them fill frames and that's what you're going to extract later, uh, you want to stop feeding because we don't want to just recycle a bunch of you know sugar syrup that we've put in there ourselves and uh, then harvest honey from that. You want the honey that you get to come from the environment. So the environment is always the best for the bees overall. But uh, granulated pure cane sugar is the best sugar to feed. And again, these are opinions. So although there are no current scientific studies to show us uh, the health benefits, no direct correlation between essential oils and uh, bee overall health and well-being, even though there are claims out there, for example, that uh, if you use essential oils in your sugar syrup, you're actually gonna drive out varroa mites and cure trachea mites and everything else. There are no solid scientific studies current that, uh, that we can rely upon to tell us that that's true. So what we know to be true is it will extend the life of your sugar syrup and keep it from spoiling. So next is from Ken Blue. Can a new beekeeper open the hive too often after installing a new package of bees. I think this happens a lot with new beekeepers that they just wanna get into their beehive all the time and they just wanna pull it open and see what's going on in there. And I'm here to tell you that the more you open your beehive, the less content your honeybees are going to be. And there are a lot of people out there that are gonna say that my bees love me, they know me, they recognize me when I come in the bee yard. And uh, I'm not here to challenge you that, but I am gonna tell you that uh, your bees are doing a lot of work in there, and if you've just installed a package, by the way, when a package of bees comes, 
there's a queen in a cage in there. That queen, those are not her bees. So what happened uh, at the source, wherever you bought your queen in, your queen has been mated. She'll be in a little cage and uh, she'll have two bees with her, two or three, let's say. And those are there, those are workers that are there to feed the queen and there's a candy pack in there. And, uh, but the package of bees, the three pounds of worker bees that are in that cage, uh, those are not her bees. She has not been laying eggs and she has not been producing. So those are strangers to her. So what we're trying to do is you've taken them, you know, hundreds or even thousands of miles from their source, and we're going to put them in a new hive. And then what happens there is we want them to accept that queen. So even when you set them up in the hive and you put resources in there, and that's a good time to be feeding them sugar water, uh, you want them to start drawing out their own comb and establishing themselves and start foraging and bringing resources back to that colony. And that's when you know that they're kind of setting up shop. Uh, the queen is still alien to them. So they're getting acquainted. Now, when they start feeding her in two or three days after you've put your package in your colony, uh, you're going to release the queen if they haven't chewed through the sugar yet and released her on their own. If they've done that, then she's already out there. So you will be checking three or four days in after you install your package, to see if the queen got out. And once she's out and doing okay, get the queen cage out of there, push your frames together and uh, close it up. Don't spend a lot of time looking at your bees. And because I understand, you know, we're, we're curious and we want to see what's going on and we want to see every cell, we want to pull every frame. That is very disruptive to the colony of bees. And if you disrupt them enough, uh, if you go after that queen and bother her a lot, for example, and get her to behave erratically, you can actually contribute to their rejection of the queen. So you should be really hands off. If you want to do observations, sit and look at the landing board from the outside of the hive and uh, see what's going on. If they're bringing in pollen and everything, then you know things are pretty good. And if they're guarding it and everything looks good and the numbers are okay, by the way, you just installed the package, you should have an entrance reducer on there. So they're not stressed and they're easily defended. Also, back to the sugar question earlier on, where should you put that uh, syrup for a new colony when you've installed the package? It should be inside the hive, a top feeder. So you don't want to put a landing board feeder there. First of all, you've got an entrance reducer on already. So your landing board is going to be very limited and you're not going to put an entrance feeder on, I hope. You don't want to encourage robbing from other bees in the area. Even if you only have one beehive, there could be bees miles away that discover it. And uh, if they discover there's a sugar syrup resource there, they're going to go after it and your bees are going to be challenged. So um, lots of feed in there and hands off. Just stay out of it. Yes, you can open it too often. So each time you tear apart the frames and, and pull the cover off and everything else, you'll notice there's a lot of connective uh, tissue in there that there's going to be um, beeswax that they're putting around. They're making their home they're setting things up. So the more disruptive you are, the more disrupted they are. And uh, it can have a big impact on it. So you want to limit the time that you go in there. You want to be well planned. A couple of light puffs of smoke. Keep in mind, I know some new beekeepers, when they go into a hive to inspect it, they create a fog of war. They go, <laughs> they go out there with a smoker and uh, puff so much smoke in there. And they just keep puffing smoke and then they open the lid and they puff, 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 puff everything. Uh, your only purpose in puffing the smoke is uh, to calm the guard bees. And, and they're on the landing board and they're near the entrance and they're near the, the outer areas of that cluster of bees in there and then the outer areas of the brood frames. There's no reason to puff a bunch of smoke over the brood frames where the nurse bees are. They're non-defensive. So, Another side effect, when you puff a bunch of smoke, bees stop honey production and they become honey consumers. So the very thing you're hoping that they do, which is draw more comb, produce places for the queen to lay her eggs and then save their resources so that they can raise that brood and sustain a new colony of bees. That is uh, reversed to some degree when you puff them up with a bunch of smoke because the reaction of the bees to the smoke can extend for several hours. They may stop foraging other than the bees that are already out collecting nectar and resources. They actually don't because 
their perception is that there's, there's a fire nearby. They don't build resources in an area that's in jeopardy. So stay out, go very light on the smoke when you enter. Couple of puffs at the entrance, couple of light puffs under the uh, inner cover of your beehive. Wait a few moments, let them calm down, and then have a very steady but economical approach when you're going into the colony because you want to get in and out quickly. It's not a time to marvel over everything. If you really want to look at bees at length, go back to my comment before, get an observation beehive and see what's going on in there. So new packages, they're unbalanced already. They're just getting acquainted with the queen. We don't want them to reject the queen. We want them to accept her and we want them to do well. So minimal interaction with your bees uh, will benefit those bees. Number four here is from Francis Moore. When do you do splits? How do you decide which hives to split from and that will not hurt the honey production? We're actually coming into a time of year where it is really good to do splits because we're going to get a spring nectar flow. Next month sometime it's going to start here where I live. So in May we're going to see a population explosion from a lot of beehives. So you have a couple of choices. You're going to have to physically expand the space in the beehive so that it can accommodate the greater numbers. Otherwise they will produce so much honey and resources in the hive and their numbers will explode and uh, you can get a situation known as being honey bound. That's where the bees have been so good at drawing in resources from the environment that they fill all the available cells and they'll even start filling cells in the brood area, which means the queen has no place to lay. So then what the bees will do is they will take on board all those resources that they can. They will start to make a new queen cell and they're going to get out of there. So one of the ways, and you're going to monitor the numbers. If you've got thousands of bees on the front of your hive and up underneath the uh, telescoping cover for your hive and they're just massed out there, then uh, you've got a population explosion and you've got a hive that could give birth to another colony in the form of a swarm. So you can offset that by splitting them. So if you've got a 10 frame beehive box and you've got double deeps, double deeps are deep boxes. 10 frames is how many frames each box holds. And then if you have two layers of that, so you'll have frames directly in alignment with each other, sometimes you'll have 10 or 11 frames of brood. So when you do your inspection, be prepared for two things. One is to do the split. A split, for those who don't know, is uh, when you're gonna pull frames of brood from one hive and you're gonna install those frames of brood into another hive body so that you can make a new colony of bees. And what you'll do is you're going to leave the queen in the original hive, hopefully, although it's not the end of the world if you take her out and she ends up in the new split, it's just gonna waste a lot of time. But uh, you wanna leave the queen in the original hive that you're looking at. Once you've located her on a frame, I recommend that you put a queen cage over her so that she stays in her place and that you're not gonna shake her out or uh, damage her when you're doing this thing. So again, we wanna be efficient and brief and we want to move slow and steady and we want to move those frames into the new uh, hive body. So when you're pulling uh, brood frames, the bees that are on those frames are nurse bees that have never been out of the hives. They don't know where they live. So when you take those frames, you put them in the new box and uh, you're establishing a new colony by splitting the brood frames like that. You're also taking worker bees with them. Those who have been in the field will fly out and go back to the original box. Those bees that are nurse bees that have never been out of the hive will remain with your new location, even if it's only 10 feet away. So that's, what you, that's how you decide which colony to split. The ones that are maxed out, the ones that have strong numbers, the ones that have lots of brood, and there's open cells because they have to have open larval cells in there. That means you look in the little cells and you see the little white Michelin men in there and those are going to be in your new colony too because what's going to happen is they're going to be missing the queen in a couple of days and they're going to start making uh, queen cells and then once they make queen cells they're going to overfeed those with uh, royal jelly and they're going to make replacement queens now uh, and then you'll observe that again just like our discussion before when you've installed package bees when you've made a split by pulling out all of those brood frames and enough bees to keep that warm and the resources good again Sugar water is going to go on that colony too because they want to be able to get their resources inside the colony. A lot of them are not foragers yet. So we want it to be convenient. We want to build them up. 
Now, the other thing was, uh, and not hurt honey production. Well, those things are, are kind of opposed. If you're doing a split, if anytime you're reducing worker numbers and resources from a colony, you're going to reduce honey production because the honey production is relevant to the number of bees that you have in the colony. If you've got a chock-a-block full colony of bees, they are obviously capable of great honey production in a very short amount of time. And those who have uh, broodminder scales and things like that on their beehives, you get to lift that beehive and it's really heavy, uh, it's dense with honey, it's dense with nectar and resources. So you're gonna expand, you put more supers on there. Supers are extra boxes that go up above, usually medium supers because they'll be physically manageable for people. Uh, Cause you'll have a 50 pound, you know, super of honey that you have to lug around. So you have to consider what your own personal limits are. Uh, but that's honey production. If, if those are, so those are two different things. You're splitting based on a really strong colony and making a new one, or you're leaving it and you're going to expand the boxes. So now you can take advantage of those numbers in that colony and allow them to uh, extend up and fill box after box with honey. So those are two lines of thought, you know, it, really strong colony, we can split it, reduce it so they don't swarm. Uh, really strong colony, we want honey production out of it. Uh, you'll add boxes so there's more space for them to accommodate the numbers of the bees and of course the production of honey. And then now that I've told you that, they may swarm anyway. But uh, expanding the colony, if you're trying to keep honey production, you're just making bigger colonies. If you're trying to expand your apiary and have more colonies to manage in your bee yard, you're gonna be doing splits from those. And why wouldn't you split from the strongest colonies? You want those genetics because those are the ones that are doing great in your area. And uh, you can make new colonies that are much the same. They're gonna raise their own queen. She's gonna fly out to a drone congregation area and she's gonna breed with something else that survives in this area. And then she's gonna come back and lay and then you're gonna inspect her. So uh, see how that's doing and see how she's going. So that's it. What's the best finish to put on hives? Okay, here's the thing. I, I'm guilty of not using great finishes on beehives, but if you really get right down to the utility aspects of it, uh, the number one longest lasting, easiest to apply, and least expensive finish that you can put on a beehive. Beehives are, are made out of wood. We have to preserve the wood against the weather. So uh, exterior, uh, you know, household paint. That's the best stuff for your beehives. So, and then you, you know, use whatever color you want and uh, light colors in areas that are, are hot. So that's why you see the most popular beehive color is going to be white. And uh, you want it to reflect as much energy and last as long as possible. And you get a semi-gloss or a gloss white paint. And uh, you put that on there, get the best quality paint you can get a hold of. And, uh, you know, as, as boxes get older and as they age, we're gonna cycle them around. So some people dip their bee boxes in hot wax. I've personally never done that because I've never had enough hot wax to do it. So as for the longevity of that, I don't even know what's going on there. But I do know when it comes to availability and what you personally can, can get a hold of and put on your beehives, and this is a great time of year to do it before you've got your bees set out, you can get uh, semi-gloss latex exterior paint. Now, one of the things I like to do because I decorate my boxes, a lot of my beehives have my pyrography art on there, which is just wood burning. So I you know, put pictures of bees and things on there, Winnie the Pooh and all that stuff. And I want that to show. So I use uh, the very same finish that they're putting on the Blue Nose Schooner. When I was a kid, I built a, a model of the Blue Nose Schooner. And it's interesting to know that they use Minwax. Uh, they use Helmsman's exterior grade varnish on there. So that's what I put on a lot of my beehives. And what you're seeing up in the corner here are the different uh, coatings and, and you know, beehives that I have and how they've been painted or stained or uh, they've got this Helmsman uh, finish on them. Helmsman expands and contracts with the weather, but it also has a tendency to have some mold in it and uh, it can blister up, especially on the rooftops and things. So, but I personally like the look of spar varnish. So I like, I like to see the wood. I mean, if I buy these beehives that, that cost a pile of money, to be honest, and a lot of that has to do with the quality of the wood that they're made out of. I mean, these things are made out of cedar, 
Uh, a lot of the ones that come from Australia are hoop pine, for example. And uh, I like to see the wood. So that's where I put my clear finish on there. And you do three coats and you want to keep your coats thin. And some of them are doing really well and lasting really well. And others, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's because the wood moisture was too high when I put the varnish on. And I always want to do it on warm days, which uh, we haven't had much of yet this year. But uh, I like to use Minwax Helmsman for the see-through stuff to celebrate kind of the woodwork there. And then, uh, of course, household paint for the roofs and things like that. So the absolute best long-lasting finish is hands down uh, exterior household paint. So and then go to Consumer Reports or wherever. I can, uh, I'll put links to the paint that I use. Um, that's done really well. And I'll also put a link to that Minwax Helmsman down in the video description if you want to check that out. But uh, that's it, paint. And light colors, of course, uh, if you're in a hot zone. And intermediate or darker colors when uh, you're in a, a zone where it's cold all the time, you want to take advantage of some of that radiant heat. So darker colors will absorb heat from the sun. So other things to think about. Now here's a question that was asked just this morning, in fact, from Carlos. 8-frame flow hive. Okay, the 8-frame flow hive, and when we talk about Langstroth boxes, uh, there are, there's frames in them. So, these are wooden frames without foundations. And uh, when we say there's a 10-frame box, there's 10 of these that fit inside the box. And then there's an 8-frame box. When we say that, there are 8 of these that fit in that box. So those are the two widely accepted uh, sizes of boxes. The first flow hive that came out had six frames, which are flow hive frames, like these up here. And uh, that accommodated an eight frame Langstroth box. So then when we talk about the 10 frame or the seven frame flow hives, because the flow frames are really thick, uh, they're only seven to 10 and then six to 10, six to eight. So his question is, he noticed that when he puts eight of these inside the box, he actually has room for a ninth frame. Should he be putting in the ninth frame or leave the space? Let's take a closer look and I'll show you why we should stick with eight frames. Okay, so what we're doing right now is we're looking down at the brood box of a flow hive, six frame flow hive, which accommodates eight Langstroth frames. And what Carlos is talking about, see the space here on the end and the space here on this side. You could, of course, rack all the frames over to one side and then you have enough space here for another frame. So we could actually have nine frames instead of eight in here. So is that a good idea? No, it's not. What you want to do is center all of your frames and then I like to butt them all up against each other, even though there are some beekeepers that like to let your bees draw out longer combs so they'll actually move them and put more space between them. But remember, this is not a honey super. This is the brood box down here. But even if it was a honey super, you want to leave yourself room because when you get into the beehive, you're going to come along with your hive tool and you're going to very carefully get between these and you're going to push this over until you get one of these frames separated on the end. And then once you've separated it out, you're going to get in here and you're going to pull the frame up and you're going to take it out and hang it on a frame hanger or you're going to lean it on the side of your hive. That leaves you space to work so that you can take each subsequent frame and you can carefully pry them apart because there'll be propolis and wax in here and then you'll just be moving them over keeping them in the box and then you'll be able to see in and inspect the frame. Some people pull two and then they go ahead about inspecting until you can get into the brood and see that everything's good to go and then you're going to put all that back together and remember what I said earlier when you're doing your inspections and you realize the information that you're hoping to get from the hive like you want to see did the queen get loose, is the queen laying eggs and things like that once you get to a spot where you can see brood and you can see that that queen is laying, it's time to close everything up. Everything's good. Don't risk the hive and uh, don't be exposed longer than you need to. And I'm also going to show you a little bit here on how this frame 
uh, tool works. So let's look at that. Now this is what I want you to pay attention to when you go into your beehive and you're getting into the boxes. Remember, let's treat it like an operation game where you want to be very accurate in your movements and you don't want to do any banging or slamming around. So the way this hive tool is designed, if you notice it has a little shoulder here on the back, that's so that when you get in here and you leave enough space to get that in, you're going to put it in and rest this right on the hive frame next to it and use that to pry this up and don't let things drop or bump or slam. And then you're going to go over to the other end and you're going to do the same thing and you're going to pry it up. And then once you get your frame up, you're going to pull it very carefully and we want space. You want this space provided when you remove to that frame. And now if we had nine instead of eight in here, we wouldn't have the room to really work. So then you're going to be pulling your frames out very carefully and not banging and slamming and tapping things. And then you're going to do your inspections, get the information you need, and you're going to put it all back. But I wanted to demonstrate the purpose of that because some people pry and grip and, and they bang it against the adjacent thing or they drop them back in or they get it partly up and it falls down. You want to keep your movements very fluid. You want to have non-impact no bumping and jarring, and you want to use these tools the way they're designed to pry things up just so you can get a hold of it. And then you'll pry up the other end. And again, don't scrape these and bang them along the bottom. You don't know where the queen is either. So leave yourself working room, push them all towards the middle. And again, this is just my method. People may say different things, but I would personally not uh, fill the whole box with nine frames just because you have this nice open space. And I would alternately, next time you go into it, I would open from the other side and uh, get to the frames in the middle. But you, this allows you to have the access to move frames to the side so you break the bond and then you're going to pull them up. So that's it for that. I hope that answers your question, Carlos. So that is it. That is frequently asked questions for beekeepers number 12. And uh, upcoming, uh, we have those swarm collection boxes out, of course, the uh, swarm troopers that are out in the trees. And if they get occupied by swarms, we're going to be showing that hopefully by next Friday. You never know. Uh, when the packaged bees come out this year, people have asked to see detailed installation methods for that. That's coming up. And uh, that's pretty much it. So thanks for watching. I hope to see you next time. And I hope that uh, your bees are doing really well wherever you live. Please feel free to post your questions down in the comments section. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again.